Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of A Handful of Hope. I'm so happy and grateful to have Lisa Song Sutton with us here today, who is an entrepreneur, real estate investor, and former Miss Nevada. She started her business career working in a top Las Vegas law firm. She then went on to create multiple companies of her own. Her first business, Sin City Cupcakes, is an iconic Las Vegas treat that delights tens of thousands of locals and visitors each year. Lisa is also co-founder of Ship Las Vegas, Elite Homes, Christie's International Real Estate, and Liquid and Lace Swimwear. Lisa often publishes articles for Forbes, Inc. Magazine, and Business Insider on business and entrepreneurship. She's passionate about sharing her message of leadership, empowerment, and action with various audiences, encouraging people, especially women, to take a seat at the table and make their voices heard. Lisa continues to stay actively involved in her community, serving on a nonprofit boards, including Startup Nevada, Nevada's only statewide business incubator, and has been selected as a global shaper by the World Economic Forum and was named a top 10 social entrepreneur to watch. Lisa, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk and I think before we get into the to some of it, let's start with the light stuff about the, the cupcakes, the Sin City cupcakes. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about those. I know you, in our previous conversation, you talked about them, and it was one of those things that I, I'm a frequent Las Vegas visitor, and I was shocked I didn't know about it. So I just, I want everybody to know about Sin City cupcakes and how delicious they are for their next Las Vegas trip first. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, it's just such a fun, fun, fun company. I mean, we make boozy cupcakes in a place that, you know, people come to overspend, overindulge, buy and do things you're not going to buy and do at home. And so it's just, you know, a perfect uh, pairing here in Las Vegas. And then how has that business been through COVID? Because I would imagine that is a very, uh, with so many people coming into Vegas, I imagine Vegas would be one of those places that is pretty impacted by tourism. Absolutely. And, you know, the majority of our clientele are tourists. And so, um, you know, March of 2020, when the governor shut down the strip, I mean, the strip had not been closed for name your catastrophic event, you know, 9-11, the one October shooting. I mean, the strip was not closed. And he closed the strip and it was just a huge um, eye-opening experience for us, you know, at Sin City Cupcakes. Um, we just kind of tightened up the belt and luckily we're an aged company. We started the company in 2012. Uh, so we just kind of tightened up the belt and we were like, okay, we don't know what's going to happen. So let's just hold on to our seats and, um, you know, scrap everything that we had planned for this year and find out what's going to happen. Um, and so luckily uh, we weathered that storm. Um, now, you know, even just starting last summer, actually, um, once the strip reopened, there were people who started to come back to the strip all through last year. And then now this year, um, you know, the pools are going to be opening up in March, which is really exciting. Conventions are coming back. So, you know, it'll take a little bit of time, but Vegas is absolutely well on its way back. Um, and we are thrilled to be part of that um, reemergence again. That's awesome. And I'm curious, Lisa, what are some of the big lessons in leadership and as a business owner you've learned this last year that were things that you put into practice plays that you had to run for your businesses that you didn't expect to have to run i think just um you know being willing to um a pivot right like you have to be unfortunately like we as business owners at least for me i hate being reactive i try to be as proactive as possible but sometimes you can't you know predict everything like a global pandemic right <laughs> um so um, I, I think, you know, being willing to be reactive sometimes and just realizing that um, as a leader, you are the one who has to be in that position to show strength and um, support your team. Because um, when there's a lot of unknown factors, you don't have the magical answers, but people are looking to you for answers. So, you know, you have to balance that um, with also navigating what the uncertainty is and, and trying to break through every day. But I mean, for me personally, on a personal level, uh, 2020 was an absolute lesson in uh, diversification. Um, so I've got Sin City Cupcakes, right? Which for the longest time was like my flagship business. Um, for as hard of a hit that Sin City Cupcakes took in 2020, conversely, real estate and shipping both went through the roof. We actually had our best years in both of those companies in mm. 2020. And so thank God, right? Like, thank God I was diversified just from a personal perspective in my own personal business portfolio. Um, because 
you know, I'd, I'd taken Sin City Cupcakes for granted almost, right? It was so easy. It was such an easy, fun business that churned right along. And every time the strip was busy, we are busy, right? And so who can foresee a time when the Las Vegas strip is not going to be busy? Yeah, that sounds like some, you know, you see those scenes in the disaster movies. Yes, like post-apocalyptic. That's exactly yeah. what it looked like around here. Yeah. Like, it, you you don't imagine it. And even like like the Bellagio, for example, I remember they had to board up the front of the Bellagio in like March of 2020. Obviously, it was very temporary, but they had to board it up because there's no locks on their front doors. Literally, there are wow. no locks. There's no locking mechanism wow. at the entrance of these casinos because they're literally not meant to close, right? They're not meant to be closed. They're not meant to be locked. So there were no locking mechanisms. So they had to board them up because they had no other way to lock them. Wow, that's incredible. Lisa, when, in our earlier conversation we had, you were sharing with me about some of the talented people you've been able to hire through this by kind of thinking outside the box and going into different industries. And I'm wondering if you might be willing to just share on that and, and ideas for people who are listening and leadership and business owners about looking outside the box for talent, because I've, I've been of the belief, and this was something that you very much confirmed, is with so much disruption out in various marketplaces, you have just some superstar talent out there that is waiting to be scooped up if you're a savvy business owner thinking outside the box. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, just as an example, here in Las Vegas, we have so many talented people in hospitality and food and beverage, right? We, we are a hospitality town, right? Service, we are a service town, a full service town. And um, when the pandemic hit, you had all these really, really talented people in hospitality and food and beverage who all of a sudden did not have a job. And um, in my other lines of business, you know, um, Christie's International Real Estate, we're a real estate company, right? So what is, what is real estate and what is high-end real estate? It's a full service, um, you know, service brand, right? It's a service company. And um, we've had great success um, hiring um, new agents who have a background, you know, several years background or almost a decade background in service and hospitality, and guess what? They're crushing it as real estate agents because they know what it's like. I mean, some of these VIP hosts, right? They, they know what it's like to be resourceful. Like they've had to jump through hoops, right? They, they had some high roller who was like, I want an elephant in my suite at the Bellagio at 11 o'clock tonight or whatever crazy demands come down the pipeline. And you have to be resourceful, right? You can't just say, no, I'm sorry. I can't do that. Like you have to be resourceful. Um, so taking that same skill set and knowledge and then plugging it into a different industry like real estate, it's, it's a perfect skill set. Um, you have to be resourceful. You have to be responsive. I mean, think about these VIP hosts. They're constantly on their phone, right? They're constantly yeah. checking their phone. They're constantly responsive. Same thing in high-end real estate. You have to be on top of your inbounds. You have to be responsive. So it's the same skill set. It's the same hustle. And now we're just, you know, training them into a different industry. And it's been really great. How do you see, I know it from your bio, you're saying you, you're really passionate about sharing your web, your message and encouraging women, especially to come and take a seat at the table. And I've long been an advocate for that. I think that we'll see this massive shift as more women emerge into leadership because there's going to be a greater, uh, women have, I think the leadership capacities of men, but they come with an emotional skill set that men are sorely lacking and seem to for lack of a better word, not be willing to tap into. And so I'm wondering, do you see in this post-COVID world that we enter into more opportunities for women to emerge in leadership? And what does that landscape look like? 100%. I think, you know, luckily, like, like we live in America, right? Like we live in a place where um, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, like you absolutely can start a business. You can jump in both feet first. And then the question is, you know, how do, how do you climb, right? Like, how do you make yourself visible? How do you make sure that you have a seat at the table? Um, and I think with the, you know, emotional intelligence of um, maybe, you know, women versus men or, um, you know, I, I've seen in business and especially in, in real estate um, and in law as well, you know, back in the day, I think, um, women tend to be better listeners sometimes. And so as a result, when you're working with a client, right, and especially in something like real estate where it's a very emotional decision, it can be a very emotional decision, um, women are sometimes better listeners. And so they're really hearing what the client needs and what the client wants and maybe even reading through the lines a little bit. 
um, when, when we get down to the nitty gritty of, well, why exactly do you want to sell? And, um, you know, what is it that you want to downsize for, that you want to expand up for? Um, I think that the listening component and just the, um, like I said, the emotional intelligence of um, being able to be empathetic and um, choosing to like be present with your client and your customer, right? Um, I see that often, um, I, I guess men and women, but mostly men um, where they have so much other things going on and they're looking forward to like four or five steps ahead that they're not present in what's going on mm. in that transaction in that moment. And so they're missing uh, these subtle components that um, I think a lot of our like female agents, we just tap into uh, more innately. I feel like that presence piece is going to be even of a higher value now as we emerge in the post COVID world, because it seems like, gosh, I was just on a call the other day talking with this group who I'm doing a keynote for. And they were saying that one of the things that they're consistently hearing from attendees and these various business owners is that they have missed the connection they miss mm -hmm. the, the people being in front of them, being able to be around other people. And so I'd imagine that presence piece becomes something that we once took for granted. And now it's going to be something we're really, really craving of, of no, 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 don't just hurry me on and usher me through, but just be here in the moment with me. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I see it, you know, even in the um, in-person meetings that I've had and, and have been taking, you know, over the past couple of months, people are craving to be around someone else, right? And then they're craving to be heard and, and they're craving to, you know, be present with someone and you really can't do that over a screen. Like there's such a limitation, um, even though it's live and in person, but it's over a screen. And um, there's just something so tangibly different with sitting down with someone, looking them in the eye and listening to them in person. Have you seen, I'm curious, have you seen real estate buying trends shift through COVID. Where I live in Santa Barbara, it's been really interesting to see so many people here as in Vegas, it's been a very hot real estate market. And mm -hmm. so much of that has been people making exoduses from the big cities. Right. Getting out of the big city, going here. I'm curious, is, what have the trends been in Vegas around that? Well, one, I mean, we've seen a huge influx of people um, coming from high tax states. Right, I think just with the the political landscape shifting and um, you know changes coming down the pipeline um, in relation to those policies, people are fleeing high tax states. California, in particular, I mean, every single week we're working with new buyers coming in from California, who um, not only have realized that they've had a chance to appreciate their real estate in California, so they're selling that off or taking the equity out, and then coming to a place like Nevada where your money just goes so far. Um, and yet you still have all the big city amenities here, right? Like we have, we have the strip, right? Which is you know, all the amazing food, all the entertainment, like everything you could possibly want. Uh, we have a great airport. A lot of direct flights go everywhere out of the Vegas airport. Um, and our state, Nevada has, you know, no state income tax. We have low corporate tax. So um, you, you're seeing that component as well as um, people realizing they don't have to live uh, near their place of work anymore because now perhaps they're working remotely or they're realizing they can move company headquarters because their entire staff is now working remotely so they don't have to be based in whatever city they're currently in and so they'll move to a place like Nevada uh, where their money just goes so much further and that translates into you know perhaps a better quality of life um, more flexibility and just trends in general I mean people want space right and that's why it's important for your money to go far because you can spend you could spend $600,000 here and have a beautiful, large home with a backyard, uh, you know, near walking trails, like, like you have opportunity to be outside. Um, and yet you also have space inside and outside. Yeah. I, I don't think $600,000 buys a front door in Santa Barbara right now. Which is <laughs> just, just so <laughs> crazy. Like yeah. that is so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. In a previous conversation, Lisa, you had shared with me that I think it was at one point you had done 500 public appearances in a span of about 18 months. And those that were the most memorable to you, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, were some of the ones that you did with kids. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm wondering what was so special about those, those experiences and what did, what, what did you learn from kids in doing all those appearances? Yeah, well, you know, as a former Miss Nevada, I mean, my role when I was Miss Las Vegas and then um, winning the title, the state title as Miss Nevada, um, that's when I did all those appearances, right? I was traveling around the entire state, um, you know, reading in, in schools and volunteering in hospitals and working with nonprofits. Um, and the kids, I mean, 
if you walk into an elementary school with a sash and a crown on, I don't know what it is, but the, it, like you may as well be like Michael Jackson, right? Like you may as well be the most, you know, ridiculous international superstar that they've ever had a chance to meet in their entire life. They're screaming, they want to hug you. They're so excited that you're there and just spending time with them. And so I would use that to promote my public service platform. Um, which is, you know, engagement in the community and, of course, just fostering the love of reading. I'm an avid reader, um, and so I love, uh, you know, Nevada Reading Week and these different things that I got to participate in um, because it's something so simple and so small. I mean, it's literally, I, I was on this tour through the entire state, and I was, I was banging them out. I was doing, like, 45 minutes per school, and we were just, like, on the move, you know, um, and it was just so much fun. I think it's, um, it's the enthusiasm, right? Like, kids innately are curious and they're excited and they want they crave new things they want to learn something new and so um even if you're telling them the exact same thing like they hear from their parents every day it's different coming from someone else yeah. and i just think you know pageantry and and the crown and the sash it's, it's such a great tool and you can use it as a microphone to really amplify community engagement you know public service platforms um, and just connect with these kids e Hearing that the curiosity and the excitement, it seems like kids, if we if we look at them from the outside perspective like that, they they provide some invaluable tips and behaviors that we can model as business owners or aspiring and budding entrepreneurs, right? It's mm -hmm. it's it's that thing of I hear so many people say, I can't wait till it goes back to normal. I can't wait it goes back to normal. I can't wait till things go back to normal. And I'm always wondering, well. What is that even going to be? And why not be curious yeah. about what the new normal can be? It seems like mm -hmm. so many people are in this holding pattern versus a creating mm -hmm. pattern. Yes. And it's right. And, and please jump in here. But I feel like one of the magic things about kids is there's not such a holding pattern. There is such a, a creative and openness part of them that is just so innate. And it's just, it's such a beautiful thing to see that play out in action. Well, and they're so adaptable, right? They're far more adaptable than we as adults are, right? Because we're, we get set in our ways and, you know, we've got these like filters on uh, based on past life experiences, right? So we've been hardened a little bit, I think, to change. And with kids, they're so adaptable. And so they just roll with the punches, uh, you know, oh, all of a sudden you have to wear a mask. And so they just, they just wear it, right? But then they continue on with their regular activities. And I think um, there's great lessons to be pulled from that because, we, um, we as adults have to learn how to be more adaptable as well, because we can't control these like outside factors, right? We can't predict everything, especially certainly in business. We can't control everything, even though we very much want to. Um, so how do we be more adaptable and flexible? And I know like the buzzword is pivot, but um, without that ability to do so and having that kind of abundance mindset where you're like, you know what, like it's okay for me to change up what I'm doing, um, without that mindset, I think that's when people start to, you know, kind of lose their way a little bit because you would just won't, you won't adapt. Right. And if you, what is that saying? It's like adapt or die. Like yeah. if you don't adapt, right. Eventually you become like a Toys R Us or a blockbuster or, you know, name your now defunct out of business business. Um, I, we have to adapt. We have to be willing to, to do that. I'm curious out of those, all those appearances you did with kids, was there a school or a student encounter that really stood out to you the most? Oh my gosh, I have stacks and stacks and stacks of letters from the kids that I met. And they're actually like, I'm in my condo right now. And I have these like, like some of my most treasured moments from that time are not like the sash and crown. I have like um, framed uh, just a collage of like letters from kids and they would draw pictures of me and like write me letters. And um, it, it's just so special. It's just such a special, special connection that you make with them. And um, thank goodness for social media because now, you know, to this day, I'm still able to keep in touch with, you know, some of these kids I met when they were in elementary school. Now they're in middle school and high school, you know, and they're wow. like finding me on Instagram. But um, it's amazing to like watch their journey and to hear from them that they appreciated meeting me when they were in fourth grade. And, you know, what I told, you know, I, I was signing like shirts and hats and stuff. And um, I mean, they still have that stuff. And right? I wrote like um, dream big, I would write dream big. And then I'd sign my name on, on stuff they'd give me. And some of these kids still have that. And it just wow. blows my mind. Um, and it's just such a, 
a reminder that like, you know, we have just a, such a great responsibility to, you know, kids and like youth in our nation, youth in our community. Like if you are, a, you know, a business owner, especially, but like, you know, if you're just someone who's involved in the community, like kids need positive role models in their life. They need as many of them as possible. There's no finite number, you know, and so get out there and get involved, participate in, you know, a reading week or whatever it is at your local elementary school, because it just goes such a long way. God, I so appreciate you sharing that, Lisa, because I feel like so many people want to do more or something to help others, and they feel like they can't or they're incapable because, and then there's a laundry list of lack, but it's like that story, that voice, the presence, all those things are just, you know, if you can read, you can make an impact on a child. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. And like bring in your own favorite book. You know, I would bring in um if you give a mouse a cookie for like the like younger yeah. kids, you know. Um, but then I would just bring in like Dr. Seuss books and just like read. Like they don't care what you're reading. You know what I mean? It's not like you have to find something that's like super impactful and teaches them a life lesson. Like, no, the fact that you're there and like they're so excited just to chat with you after and you'll know, just answer questions. You know, they'll ask you like what you do for your job and, and you'll know, they'll maybe they'll ask you about college or whatever. But it's like they just crave people in their lives who, you know, make them feel good, you know, someone who's positive, like, and that's what kids need to see, especially right now. Again, there's a, such a, a beautiful lesson for business owners and entrepreneurs too, is just uh, taking time to reflect on how you're making the people that you're working with feel, mm -hmm. right? It goes yeah. back to that giving the attention. Like, it, it doesn't take much to, it, and it seems like these are a lot of times some of the metrics that we forget to really quantify because it's hard to quantify those types of things, but it, it's, I, and I'm sure you've had this experience too, but it seems for me like every single business owner, leader I talk in, no matter what industry they're in, it comes to the same thing. There's people are missing connection. People are wanting that human interaction. They're, they're feeling uncertainty, fatigue, whatever that is. And it's, it's these things that was often in, when things are growing so fast, we sometimes take for granted because we're, you know, churning out more and doing more and, and growing, growing, growing. But it's really mm -hmm. the kids just have such a beautiful thing about they have really become always make sure you're conscious of how you're treating people, especially when you're growing. Mm -hmm. One hundred percent. And they're so good about being present. I mean, you know, when, when you're in a classroom, like all eyes are on you and they are just, you know, they're soaking up every single thing that you're saying and doing. Right. So I mean, there's so many great lessons that we can pull from that. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of truth in saying that, like, there's, there's a certain layer of, um, you know, childlike behavior that, you know, we can really learn from as, as adults and as business owners, certainly. Can you share a little bit with us about Startup Envy? What is it? What are you guys up to? What do people yeah, know it's, about it? Yeah, it's a great nonprofit. So it's a nonprofit that's here in Nevada. It's the state's largest business incubator. Um, and I'm so blessed to be on their board. They're doing amazing things. Um, they have an accelerator and an incubator. And I mean, they're really focused on just, you know, early stage startups and, and people, you know, branching out into entrepreneurship. Um, a place like Nevada, we're so business friendly and our tax structure lends itself to that. And so why shouldn't there be a place that just really fosters entrepreneurship and, and business ownership? Um, what I love about Startup NV too is that there's not this push of like, oh, like make sure you quit your day job before you pitch us anything because we have to know you're serious. Like there's, I think there's a lot of um, accelerators that um, have that message. And when I started my, my you know, entrepreneurship journey, I still had a day job. I worked at a law firm full time for the first 18 months that Sin City Cupcakes was around. And that was simply because I wanted to mitigate my risk, right? Like I still wanted income coming in because starting a business is expensive and it always costs you more than you anticipate. So how lucky was I that I could still earn an income and, you know, have my bills paid and, and uh, my health insurance taken care of, you know, those kind of basic things. Um, and then my extra money, instead of going on vacations with my girlfriends or buying lots of shoes like I was doing before, I would take my extra money and put it towards my business. So you can do that, you know? And that's what I love about Startup NV is that like we encourage every level of entrepreneurship. Um, you have, you know, die hard, quit your job, you know, go all in. You have, um, you know, part-time solopreneur. It, it, entrepreneurship is not one singular definition. And so I love that Startup NV um, appreciates and supports the whole gradient. 
You know, I, that's an interesting point. That I appreciate you mentioning talking about not going and spending money on shoes, but instead putting it back in your business. And I say that because I feel like one thing social media has done is, so to the benefit that's brought a lot of awareness to entrepreneurship, what it looks like starting your business, I think to the detriment is people have learned that they can market basically entrepreneurship as this, you start a business on Friday and by Monday, you have a Lamborghini, you have a and Lamborghini. A mansion. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're on Instagram, you're Insta famous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's just, it's, and so then you have people going in thinking it's just going to be this 48 hour, just put your nose to the grindstone and then boom, you're done. And they find yeah. out it's way more harder. It's way more painful and it's much longer with that. So I'm wondering solid business advice for a budding entrepreneur who is thinking about starting a business or maybe one who's in the early stages of starting a business what is a what is a really realistic timeline for them of of going in so they're not going in there thinking okay i'm gonna have my lamborghini on monday but even more so too i think is something about i i often talk with people about what are they pulling out versus what are they putting back into the business and mm -hmm. it's that impulse of and maybe it's, this is to such a detriment of society that we've almost commoditized happiness in this culture right happiness yeah. is that lamborghini happiness is this thing right and it's not to say that happiness can't come from those things but if we're using those things to try to be the vehicle of happiness we're going to probably hit a dead end pretty quick so sure. i'm curious like you know entrepreneurs who are listening to this right now who are considering starting a business or in the early stages of business what are the two or three best tips if you were to start a business or early stages of starting a business today that you could pass on to them don't expect to make money in the first one, two or three years. Like, honestly, like it, it depends on the industry and there are the unicorns out there, but I actually did a social media post about this the other day. I said, you know, it took, um, it took my first business 18 months to, to turn a profit. It took my fourth company two and a half years to turn a profit, you know, and meanwhile, my second and third businesses in between, it took me four months to turn a profit. Like mm. it just depends on the industry, it depends on timing. There's so many factors that you can't control, but what you can control is your preparedness, right? So just make sure that you are prepared to not make money. And then you can be pleasantly surprised when you have like hockey stick growth and life's good. And, and you buy the Lambo two years before then you planned, right? Like you have to be prepared though, because I think that's when people get frustrated, right? They expect to turn a profit in the first six months because that's what they're seeing on Instagram. And if there's anything I've learned, you know, now being a decade into business, um, is that anything that can allegedly make you money quick will also drain your money quickly, right? I mean, uh, the, these like get rich quick, whatever, you know, easy road, that's all BS. It really is all BS. Every single successful person in your life, every single successful business owner that you know had to grind. They had to grind. So I say this all the time, like it took me, it took me 10 years to become an overnight success. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, you and I are, are on your podcast talking about how great my life is and all the companies I have. It took me 10 years to build what I have and I still work every day. I love it, but it's a grind. So, you know, go in with realistic and I would say lowered expectations. So that, that way you can be pleasantly surprised and, and enjoy the fruits of your labor, perhaps earlier than you anticipate. But if you go in with an unrealistic mindset, when are we disappointed? It's when expectations don't match reality, right? So, you know, don't set yourself up for failure. I hope everybody really listened to that too, especially with having a business, having a job, and then while working on the business too, think about what it's like to be an attorney. And some of my friends who are attorneys, I know the high level thinking and concentration that's evolved in that work. So you're doing that for the first part of the day and then to go and shift mental gears to into a yeah. growth and creativity of building a business. It's, it's something that really, I think, speaks so authentically to the entrepreneurial journey about what it really is to start up a business and what really needs to go into it. Like you have to be prepared to maximize that investment into yourself and that in the start a business Friday, have a Lamborghini on Monday is the exact opposite of that. It's it actually, is. yeah, here's exactly. the bare minimum. Yep, exactly, exactly. And you know, somewhere, especially in that time in my life, I mean, I was able to do that because I was what, 27 years old, right? And so I, I wasn't married, I didn't have kids, I didn't have dogs yet at that point. Like <laughs> I, I had, I had the flexibility to be very, very selfish. And, and you know, let's be transparent. I mean, of course, like my personal relationship suffered because of that, because I was being so selfish around what I wanted 
to build. And so I'd work all day. I, I worked five and a half days a week at the firm. And then my nights and weekends, what was I doing? We were baking. I was running deliveries. We were running events. Like we were catering, like all the, you wear all the hats in the beginning. And so that left no time for, you know, a, a, a good personal relationship because I wasn't present, right? How could I be present? Um, I was focused on these other things. So um, I think that there's, you know, a balance that has to be struck eventually, but like, if you just have it in you that that's something that you want to do and want to pursue, then, you know, realize that like, that's what it's going to take. You're going to have to be selfish, but make sure you communicate that. Like, I, I think that that's something I, I didn't do at that time was I didn't do a good job of communicating what my mindset was and where I was at. And so like other people around me got hurt because of my ambition. And so like, that's definitely like one thing I do regret. Like I wish I would have been more communicative and like just would have realized it then. Um, I certainly realize it now, um, but at that time, I mean, you're just, you're so into it, right? But I guess know that going in. So if you're brand new, you know, and going into entrepreneurship, realize like it's, it's a selfish endeavor in some way, right? Because you're pursuing something so hardcore that you believe in. Um, so make sure you communicate to the people around you that like you are not going to be available and that they're not going to be the priority anymore. And I think that's relevant too for new entrepreneurs, but people who have been in business for a while and people are in leadership. Oh gosh, I can't tell you how many people in leadership that are constantly struggling and finding the balance. And inevitably there's always this piece of, of not understanding that they need to, exp to, to, that people in their lives have these expectations of what it means yeah. to respond to a text message or return a phone sure. call or get together. Mm -hmm. And just to be able to explain that. So that way it, it relieves them of those expectations and they mm -hmm. can try to find what then that new medium ground is in that, in the, in that the role requires of them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it's just, you know, that, that was a learning lesson for me. Right. Which I, you know, since then have tried to overlay into, you know, my personal relationships since then, because that was a really hard, learning lesson. I didn't realize it until the back end when, you know, things were over that I was like, oh gosh, I could have, I could have navigated that so much better. Hmm. Do you find that you, you value your personal relationships now having gone through that journey differently than you did at the beginning of it? Oh my gosh, 100%. You know, now like I really try to make time for like, you know, the FaceTime catch-ups, especially with like, you know, good friends of mine who don't live in Vegas, right? Like we all try our best to carve out time for each other. And, um, you know, certainly in my personal relationships, I've realized like time is, is our like one resource that like we can't buy, right? Like we can't like create it ourselves. Like, like there's so many different limitations on it. So regardless of how busy you are, I find that like, it's true. Like if something's important to you or if someone's important to you, like you will make time. And so it's just a matter of, of adhering to that and doing that. Lisa, we're coming up on our time. So before I ask my final question, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Yeah, so I'm on social, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Lisa Song Sutton, and you can head over to lisasongsutton.com. Perfect, and we'll make sure to include those on all the show notes and everything too. Perfect. Going forward into 2021 and beyond, I, with that idea of making time, because I feel like people are relating to time differently. It's interesting how many people will say they feel like this year, last year has been a Groundhog's Day experience. And then for others, it's been the exact opposite. Every day has been so dramatically different than the day before it. What are you, do you find that you are making, what are you looking at making more of a priority for time-wise now and going into the future since this last 2020 year has happened and unfolded? Um, well, you know, I'm really excited for, you know, expansion and, and some of the growth opportunities that we have across my businesses. Um, so, you know, my foot's on the gas pedal in that regard for those things. Um, but, you know, just touching back on, you know, what we had talked about before, um, carving out time for those, you know, personal relationships, um, because our, our relationships are really um, what help, you know, help us grow. They help us um, in so many facets of our lives. And I think if we don't focus on that and concentrate on that, it's easy to get lost and, you know, kind of lose our way and, and lose our purpose, right? Like, why are we working so hard? Why are we working so hard? Yeah. And it's because we want to, ultimately for me, right? Like I want to provide a lifestyle for myself and my future family and, you know, all those things. And so um, in order to do that, you have to have great personal relationships in your life. And so I have to continue to, you know, be present in that and carve out time for that. 
Everyone, my goodness, are you going to want to rewatch and re-listen this one? We covered a lot, and there are so many nuggets in here that Lisa shared with us, starting with the idea of what, where we can look for talent and new talent, new opportunities in the post-COVID-19 world. Lisa talked about finding people who, she lives in a hospitality and service town and going from following people from one hospitality industry into another hospitality, one that may not actually make sense when you think of it, but it ends up being a huge win afterwards. Where is there talent out there that you're not seeing because you're so used to looking in the same way? Where can you expand your field of focus and find new talent for your business? Looking at really keeping your foot on the gas. So if you're in a space of growth and you're growing and many of us are coming out of this 2020 into 2021 and beyond timeframe in a space of growth, keeping your foot on the gas, but making sure you carve out time for those personal relationships. I love that Lisa acknowledged that if she could go back and change and do things over again, it would be something that looking at how she would address some of those personal relationships that suffered. You know, setting those expectations with the people that you love and care about in your life and making that time to enrich the relationships while you put your foot on the gas is such a vital piece of it. Gosh, who can you look to in your life for examples of what it means to be, live a better life, to be a better human, to run a better business? Kids. I love Lisa shared their stories about the kids and all those experiences she had and how they shared these notes and cards with her and about just a simple act of taking time to read, to use your voice, to share your story. It, it really is a powerful reminder that each of us have so much to give and so much to offer to especially younger generations. You know, sometimes we get in our head and we say we're too busy or what are they gonna learn from me or who can, what do I have to offer? And oftentimes that's limited because of the crowd we're trying to affect. Remember, there's always this generation below and younger who's coming up and they're still looking up and looking for people who are willing to share their voice, to share their stories, to just take time to read, to share the delights of give a mouse a cookie. And speaking of cookies, while it may not be a cookie, it's a cupcake. Next time you're in Las Vegas, be sure to check out Sin City Cupcakes. I know I will overly indulge in them the next time I'm in Vegas, and I hope you all will be too. Lisa, this has been such a joy to share this time with you. Thank you so very much for being here today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We'll see you next time, everybody, on another edition of A Handful of Hope. Bye-bye.